So welcome everyone to another exciting episode of the Magic Sandwich Show, where it is a huge pleasure as ever to welcome the usuals, Concordance and Thunderfoot, but also for the first time in many months, uh, Mr. Aron Ra, I'm sorry it's been so long I've forgotten how to pronounce his name, Mr. Aaron Ra, but also as our special guest, which we found out only about two minutes before the show started, huge pleasure to welcome Mrs. Aaron Ra. Welcome to the show, both of you. You can unmute your microphone now. You're allowed. You're allowed to unmute your mic, but are not allowed to, not allowed to say anything. Yeah, got it. Um, all right, I'm going to start with you. Um, I know the explanation why you haven't been able to appear on the show for the last couple of months, I, I think, um, but the audience may not. Uh, tell us what you've been up to. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, a lot of conferences, conventions, and rallies uh, going on in the last few months. I was at the uh, I was at a political rally in Tallahassee, Florida. I I, I attended Skepticon. I was um, I, I I was speaking at a couple of other things. It was Austin, and uh, and I'm I'm kind of losing track of them all now because they could kind of bleed together after a bit. But there there have been a lot of uh, out of town trips that I've been having to do. And it's been great fun. The season, however, is over for me. Skepticon was the last thing that I'm that, that I'm attending until round about February when it picks up again. And normally that would pick up with uh, the Darwin Day celebration that I've done. I've done the keynote speech for Darwin Day in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, at the guest of the James Randi Educational Foundation three years in a row, but not this year. This year, they decided to change things up. They got some scruffy, bearded cephalopod lover to take my gig. Would we know that person? I think you would. <laughs> You're not going to name names. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave it there. What sort of things have you found on your travels then? What sort of things you've been speaking on? Who have you been meeting? And what, what's it like to have the finger on the pulse? What is the pulse saying? Well, the interesting thing was that, of course, it was an election year, and, and the last couple of speeches that I did dealt directly with that. And while I, I really don't like to, uh, to politicize, I felt completely encouraged in that everything that I, was, everything that I believe in, that what we should be trying to, uh, to achieve was seemingly under threat, and so I, I had to do what I could to speak out. And it was an honor to have the opportunity to do so. You know, standing on the steps of the state capitol, or, or, or on a stage at a rally where they're holding, you know, a, a, a vote for separation of church and state, and that sort of thing. It's been great to be involved in that sort of thing. Uh, however, for the next couple of months, I'm going to be really trying to catch up to the other projects that I was supposed to be working on here at home, like, like a book I've been working on, when I have moments to work on it for the last few months, I'm trying to uh, invest Mr. time at that. Mrs. Rod, before I come to you, uh, just to remind people that if you would like to appear on the show to talk about any of the issues that we're likely to end up talking about, which I'll come to in a second, or any other of your own, uh, just send a Skype contact request to Magic Sandwich Show, uh, including in that, please, the gist of the question or topic that you would like to raise, and we'll see if we can get you on. Um, but Mrs. Rod, let me turn to you. What is it like uh, being married to a, a international public speaker of such renown as Aron Ra? <laughs> have, have you been following him on his travels? Has he taken you with him or has he left you at home? Um, he takes me sometimes. I didn't get to go to Australia or, or, or Ireland. Or Tallahassee, but you know, I bring her when I can. Uh, it was fun when we went down to Austin because, uh, I mean, I got to uh, to play limousine for a bit, you know, stuffing my car full of famous dignitaries. It was quite fun. So, of all the people you've met, I imagine there are quite a few. Who've who've ever been any that you've met for the first time that have uh, tickled you? Um, I met Zinnia Jones in uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. It was the first time I'd seen um, her speak and. That that was interesting meeting because uh, I don't know it, it's one of the few people left in this movement that I've only seen in video and hadn't actually encountered in real life. Okay, we'll probably come back to more of that um, presently. But uh, Thunder, I think you've been traveling around as well, and 
posted a couple of videos, but it's not been entirely clear what you've been up to. Perhaps you'd like to explain that as well. Uh, yeah, well, I uh, sort of misjudged things a little. Um, so we had um, some uh, beam time awarded at a neutron reactor. Um, in fact, we had almost two weeks uh, awarded, which is an absolutely phenomenal amount of, of beam time. So for the last um, two weeks, I've been within about 10 meters of the the core of a nuclear reactor. Um, and it was brutal. So in the end, um, I managed to get 107 samples done, which won't mean much to anyone here. But if you work it out, 107 samples over two weeks is about one sample every three hours. Um, and that's about the schedule that they were ticking over on. So um, I had hoped to actually get some more videos done while I was at the reactor because um, they've got some really nice facilities there, but there just wasn't the time. Um, but the iPod did go into the in, into the neutron beam. Um, are you going to are you going to tell us what happened, or are you going to save that for a video? Uh, no, no, I, I'll, I'll be a I'll be a science tease on this one. But um, I I can tell you it's sort of a, a lot of um, it it did come out fairly active, um, and oh yeah that's the other thing i wanted to broadcast it live and it was this a real irony is the only thing that i couldn't get to handshake in this in this whole line was i couldn't get uh whatever the the google hangouts to broadcast direct to my youtube channel so the uh, youtube have been sending me these um you know banner messages you know uh, I do a Google Hangout and it goes straight to your channel and I try this and it says you can't do this because you've got strikes against your channel and of course there are no strikes against my channel but um, and they they couldn't sort anything out in time otherwise I could have broadcast it straight from the reactor to the YouTube channel which I think would have been rather cool but it couldn't be done so I in the end just stuck the the iPod into the neutron beam so you get to see what the inside of a neutron beam looks like it's kind of funky so well, we'll certainly look forward to that um any indication when that's going to be out uh like i said i mean i've, I've not been back that long so okay um can, can i ask the weeks. question that everyone everyone wants to know is did you did you smuggle any spiders in for radiating because, uh, no uh, but like i mean my it, order in now it's absolutely hilarious when you look at all these superheroes. You're right. <laughs> Spider-Man gets bitten by a radioactive spider. The Incredible get Hulk gets a gamma ray overdose. Doctor Manhattan gets locked into um, some sort of uh, quantum facility when the interlocks malfunction, which is exactly the sort of thing the interlocks are meant to prevent. Uh, and yeah, they all come out with superpowers rather than dying of leukemia. Do you think this was a PR job? Because a lot of those uh, things began um, at the infancy of the nuclear age and people were obviously yeah. somewhat terrified about it. Do you think that this was a deliberate PR plan to show that nuclear radiation could actually be beneficial? Now, I mean, what, what it is, is, I mean, you're sort of right that this was mm, in the, de the, the very infancy of nuclear power, just like Frankenstein was in the very infancy of electricity. And no one really knew what it was or what it did. And so electricity brought Frankenstein to life, or Frankenstein's monster, more to the point, to life. Um, and um, with radiation, no one really knew anything about it. So it was just a woo that you could say someone got exposed to and all of a sudden they come out with special powers. But now that I think about it, Fantastic Four, they also got irradiated by a solar storm or something. And, of course, what else would happen if you got irradiated by vast amounts of cosmic radiation than becoming elastic, invisible, um, incredibly strong and made of rock, or being able to turn yourself on fire? It, it's, it's worth noting, it curious. Though. Don't you think it curious that in the Fantastic Four, for example, I mean, wouldn't it have been better if, if there were like six or eight people on the original ship and that you get these four out of these with these superpowers, but the other four on the ship died horrific, painful, exhausting deaths. 
Um, like like somebody maybe. who that their special power is that they dissolve uh, permanently, yet, or somebody else just just <laughs> winds <laughs> the, the, up the, the, with the syndrome where they burn inside and out until they're dead. There was, there was a Family Guy episode very much like this, actually, where it was um, some toxic waste or something that gave them all special powers, and Mega gets the special powers of being able to grow her fingernails really quickly. And that's it. Creepy. <laughs> 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 It's okay. worth noting, DPR, Before that we move uh, on, can I, can Superman... I just back Wait! This? Sorry. No, um, Superman came mutant, out in 1938. Mutant, mutant Ninja Turtles, what? They got some sort of radiation, didn't they? No, that was Toxic Waste again. Oh, I'm sorry. Concordia, they were radiation radiation oh. was better because it was uh, it was able to create everything from, from you know, Godzilla to Superman's weakness. I mean, it, you could do anything you needed it to do. Uh, oh, that's, if, uh, that's you, nothing. Let, let, let me add two extra points points on that. The first one is Godzilla could actually breathe radioactive fire, which which would be a, a, a bit of an environmental disaster. And the second <laughs> one, the second one is the Batmobile was nuclear powered. Now, can you imagine driving a nuclear powered car around a city? But uh, some guy in the comments, uh, Prophet Muhammad has got this really funny comment about, uh, you know, yeah, what's your superpower? Oh, what's this? Flame on. Ah, burns to death. <laughs> Concordance, back to you, because I interrupted you. You were saying something about No, I about just wanted Superman. to say that uh, Superman first came out in 1938, so pre, pre-nuclear age. Uh, and, and also, I was kind yes, of joking. Yes, but there was radioactivity the that wasn't there, and his power was related in some way to kryptonite and its radioactive powers, so... Yeah. That, but but at the, at the time, nuclear well. harvesting or, or, or harnessing nuclear power was, was beyond the pale. It wasn't even thought of at the time. Or I don't know, maybe Asimov was, was talking about stuff like that. Um, well, you got to remember, they, at the time that Superman came out, radiation was only known to do one thing, and that was diminish people's strength and kill them. That's all they knew about it. I fear before the audience thinks that we've all lost the plot and the whole <laughs> nature and tone of the show has changed with the return of Aaron. Um, let's bring it back to something more topical. Um, you mentioned, Aaron, that it was an election year. Uh, yeah. And I think that probably, I'm guessing that most of the audience know the result. Um, as a result <coughs> of the election, I understand that various petitions have been started in various states, including Texas. Um, for the idea that you should uh, succeed from the um, United States. And my understanding is that 116,000, at its last count, of uh, Texans had signed this petition, which initially sounded like quite a lot to me, but then I looked at the population of Texas and I worked it out, it's about 0.004%, so four in every thousand people have actually signed, signed this. Is, is, and and I, I raised this because, of course, um, concordances in Texas as well. Is this a serious movement? Are people taking this idea seriously? What it Actually, literally um, is... Uh, you've, missed, uh, you've missed an important piece of information. What was the petition about? The petition was to secede from the Union, to make Texas its own country again. Yeah. And, it's not, and, it, yeah, and it's, as DPR pointed out, it's not just Texas that did it, it's several other states that had this extreme faction within them, this tiny little minority of extremely immature people who want to th tro throw their toys out of the pram, as you Europeans say. And as we, as we know from dealing with, with religious people, it is a very, a very childlike mindset in many respects. And when they don't get their way, they throw a, tamper, uh, throw a temper tantrum, and that's exactly what this is. It's throwing the toys out of the pram. It's, you know, it's packing up and saying, well, I'm getting out of here, whatever. And Actually, they can't move, so they're just going to take the whole state with them. Actually, Aaron, what you want is to actually start a movement in the rest of the country to have Texas thrown out of the United States. <laughs> yes, and dig a trench around it so that we can call it its own continent. <laughs> My understanding, though, so far as the Constitution is concerned, is that Texas maintained that right. Dooming us. Yeah, that's a popular myth. Is it? Yeah, so that there's a whole group of people that for the last hundred years, I got sort of mixed up with them in college. The Republic of Texas people who print their own money and issue their own real estate deeds and uh, produce all sorts of official documents. They claim that if any small group gets together, forms a Congress, and they 
you know, file papers at a certain office that they can secede uh, unilaterally, basically, from the union. And of course, that is not the case. Uh, they also claim that the secession or that the, I'm sorry, the uh, st uh, state status of Texas was never ratified, which is also another sort of myth that they try, try to perpetuate to, to prop up this Republic of Texas group. And they've all gone to jail. I mean, they've all been raided or uh, thrown in jail or abandoned the idea. Well, you remember when Kent Hovind was was uh, on trial for his tax evasion in, in uh, Florida, he said that the United States had no jurisdiction in the Republic of Florida. But that's I how convinced, that's how inert these people are in the imaginary world that they have created for themselves. You know, I, I did a video on, on my libertarian phase in college, and people asked, you know, why, why I'm not a libertarian anymore. The Republic of Texas is a big part of why I'm not a libertarian anymore. <laughs> they are the nuts in our uh, fruitcake. Uh, <laughs> but they, they're, they riddled, the, they still do somewhat, the Libertarian Party in Texas, um, with these kinds of claims that, you know, anybody... Uh, has an equal right to issue lands and patents and uh, real estate documents and these kinds of things. Well, patents is inherently anti-libertarian, yeah? Isn't that uh, one of the things that really splits libertarians is that um, some think that you should be able to... Uh, yeah, yeah, because to, to have a patent, you need a government to run it for you. Yeah, and I'm noticing some comments in the in the chat room where the people are, you know, somebody announced that they were a libertarian. We do a lot of talk about libertarians. So real quick, I would just want to interject. Uh, if if people want to know why we're not libertarian or why you shouldn't be libertarian, the best advice I could give you would be to read the platform and then just think it through, and that should be enough. Go ahead, Thunder. Uh, no, I mean, all I, all I wanted to do is finish up on that point. I, I think the reason that they're opposed to it is that you need a government to uh, enforce the patents, and that goes straight back to if you don't pay your taxes, then when men with guns turn up to take away your freedom. Actually, uh, libertarians tend to be pretty okay with uh, litigation, and litigation um, to them is more acceptable than legislation. So you can sue someone uh, for violating your patents. Of course, if they don't comply with the courts, then you can sue them again for not complying with the courts, and then you can sue them again for not complying with the compliance of the compliance. <laughs> eventually, the men with the guns do have to get called out, right? I mean, eventually you have to put a man against his will in a box that he doesn't want to be in, or you have to take his property away from him by force. That's the ultimate chain... <laughs> You know, you can't you can't sue someone into doing something that they refuse to recognize. Yeah, well, if we're going to talk about pol if we're going to talk about politics and libertarians for a moment, I want to bring up something. <laughs> the most popular episode of Penn and Teller's bullshit was the one about bottled water, and it it made a great illustration. But the illustration, unfortunately, works against them because they were talking about on that show uh, how bottled water companies in the free market were not producing water that, that met the standards of the federal reg regulations imposed by the United States government. So they were saying on that show that many of these bottled water companies weren't as good as what as what regular tap water would be, and in some cases bottled water was just tap water. And they said that the federal re regulations that they have to ensure water safety and all like this was such a great thing, and these you know free market items weren't such a great thing because they weren't being imposed to the same standards. So they're arguing against their own position. They want to take away regulations for food and for drug and for water, for, for environmental protections and factories and that sort of thing. And then they want to allow corporations, which are the most evil thing men have ever constructed, to supposedly be governed by the markets they actually control and historically have, already, have always violated human rights when they've been unchecked. And then they want to allow monopolies, and that's the really scary part, when you have one thing that conglomerates until it owns everything else, and then we are all subservient to Omnicorp, and you've got no recourse if, it, if things don't go your way. And then they want to allow everything that we've ever achieved in the human rights and civil rights movements to just go away 
and let the corporations rule or let the imaginary free market rule, and it's completely unrealistic. There's just no way that the libertarian perspective can ever exist on the scale that they want it to be. And there was me wondering, having forgotten just how much Aaron can talk and why Mrs. Ra is always so quiet. I want to, uh, uh, before we, I, I want to point out, obviously, that this has got to be one of the few shows there are that you can go from topics such as comic strip heroes to libertarianism in a, a matter of moments. Uh, but anyway, um, on the issue of bottled water, just before I come up and bring in the, I have the next topic I want to talk about, uh, I, I had one the other day. Uh, and I was reading the details of it, and it talked about how this rainwater had landed on this range of hills in this country and how it had seeped through the limestone for 5,000 years, being enriched as it was with all these minerals that gave it this wonderful taste and whatever. Uh, and then just underneath it that, <coughs> having talked about these 5,000 years um, water cycle it had gone through, it said, uh, open within three days, drink, consume within three days of opening. Very odd. Anyway, I want, before we move on too far, I want to talk with Concordance about last week's show, which I know that you went to watch, uh, we're not present, uh, both of you and uh, Thunderfoot. Um, we had on uh, Rolf and Samuel Lamper. Uh, Rolf Lamper was the um, chairman of the Swedish Creation Creationist Association. And when the videos were posted onto YouTube, they were met with a mixed response. There were quite a few people who didn't enjoy it at all because they thought that we had given them too much time to express their views before we challenged them. Uh, starting with you, Concordance, what do you make of it? Do you think we were too soft on them? I mean, I, I compare it to when we had Cy Tenbruggen, Kate, and Eric Hovind on, which did get somewhat out of hand. I thought we were civil, but quite demanding of, of to get them to explain their views. What do you reckon? I think you, if you watch it, you can see we were increasingly less tolerant of Rolf. We kept trying to get Samuel to, to give something. They, they weren't giving us a lot to work with. It was, it was a bit boring, quite, quite honestly. It was um, a series of almost meaningless statements and redirection and non-answers. And after a while, you kind of give up. You, you you think to yourself, I can yell at this guy, but it's just going to roll to the left or to the right, and he's going to end up answering some question I didn't ask. So I didn't feel like going for the jugular, if you will. I didn't feel like uh, it was worth fighting with the guy. Let him let him reveal his own ignorance, and that's always been my strategy is let, let your enemies talk when what they're saying is, is stupid and idiotic, or, or rather doesn't make any I, sense. I think that those that uh, were too critical that we hadn't given them a hard time were those that only watched the first part, not part 1A, which I accidentally missed out on the editing, and part 2, um, where they were challenged. But as you say, my intention was give them enough rope to hang themselves with. Once you've, they've done that, then you can start putting the noose around their head. But let them speak initially, because you can't attack someone without knowing what their point is. So I, I thought we were relatively civil, um, and we did challenge them sufficiently in the second part, but hey, I think it just goes to show um, you can't please everyone. There we are, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, just a quick reminder again, if you want to join the show, send a Skype contract request to Magic Sandwich Show, talk about any of the issues that we've discussed so far and anything else uh, that comes up, or a topic of your own. Um, there was one person that sent me a message uh, I suspect he's not going to be, uh, be able to appear on the show, but I'll certainly read those questions out if no one wants to call in. And as ever, um, you know, people will leave it till the second half of the second half of the show, uh, and normally we have quite a few people at the very end trying to call in. So avoid disappointment and book early. Send a contact request; we'll get you on. Concordance. I want to move on. I know that you've been looking at some topical issues uh, that you wanted to raise. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Pat Robertson real briefly. I, I don't know that everyone follows the blogs that I follow or looks at the sites that I look at, but uh, Pat Robertson, <laughs> the host of 700 Club, right? And that Pat Robertson uh, recently came out very strongly against young earth creationism, uh, and it elicited a lot of very angry commentary from people like Ken Ham. Uh, because he said, "Look, you know, the evidence of science is such that we cannot, we can no longer assert 
that the Earth is only six or seven or ten thousand years old. It's just it's flying in the face of reality. It's harming Christianity in general for us to take a hard line on this. And that's a pretty shocking thing from a man who, by all accounts, is a pretty fundamentalist Christian uh, and has a lot of creationist followers. So I, I can say the NCSE was doing a little happy dance. Yeah, well, you got to remember that Pat Robertson also years ago came out uh, in, in, uh, in a, well, I don't know, I don't know what to say this is advocating or endorsing, but he's agreeing that uh, that climate change, what was called global warming, is a thing, that it's actually going on. Uh, and he said that years ago, so he's been against his own party on that point, too. What I don't Should understand, we be grateful is, for this guy? Sorry, what I don't understand is this, though. Um, when he says he accepts the scientific evidence that the Earth is not young, as in six, eight, ten thousand years old, um, it's the same scientific method that provides a similar sort of evidence that shows that evolution is actually a fact. And as far as I'm aware, he still denies the fact of evolution. Pat Robertson is very self-serving. I don't know why he accepts uh, evidence of any kind. It, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what the things that he does, the things that he says are so far out, out out of the realm of reality that, I mean, like, in 1994, he said that homosexuality causes earthquakes and that God was visiting earthquakes against um, uh, billions of dollars worth of damage in Bel Air and in the San Francisco area from earthquakes because where the damages were not that extensive dollar-wise in third world countries that also had earthquakes. And he said that the reason for this was not the fact that every square inch of real estate in San Francisco is more expensive than the entire country of Haiti, but because the United States, as he put it, was the only country that allowed homosexuals to live. And so he said to his 30,000 some odd followers that they should go out and kill homosexuals wherever they find them. And this would prevent earthquakes. Maybe Maybe uh, Pat Robertson uh, is trying to shore up his credibility because because he predicted Mitt the the lag's a little um, disconcerting. Uh, <laughs> well, let's plug that. Okay. Just talk. Um, and turn the volume down on that. Okay. All right. Um, because Still he predicted Mitt Romney is going to be president, and and he said Just God to told say him it, that. Dear. Technical issues. Here. Mute. So there. mute Blog TV. Oh. You're listening to there Blog you TV, oh, okay. not to the Skype conversation. There you oh, go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe he's looking for some credibility. He tried to um, he tried to say that God told him that Mitt was going to win, win the presidential nominee, uh, presidential election. What does he care about credibility? When I was in That's high school, what I was thinking. When I was in high school, this man said that the, the planetary alignment was going to be such. You know, you had all the planets in one line. And that the, the gravitational pull of Jupiter and Saturn and the giant Jovian planets was going to be so extreme on the Earth on one side with the sun on the other that it was going to rip the Earth in half in 1982. Yeah, and you don't remember that happening? <laughs> <laughs> I must have been away that weekend. <laughs> He's funny. Though. But I mean, you know, it's an embarrassment, though, that, that he was actually a presidential candidate. Yeah, yeah. What, Captain and Magic I was Man. at the Iowa caucuses when he was a presidential candidate. And it was Sorry, can you say I that again, started. Aaron? He was what? When he was a presidential candidate, I was at the Iowa caucuses raising a stink over him. What platform was he standing on, apart from extreme right-wing Christianity? No, that was it. That was it. Right. He wanted God. He, 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 had, he had proclaimed that you know the, the goal and, and sole purpose of the Christian right was to dominionism that they were supposed to dominate everywhere in the world and that the you know the most powerful country in the world of course had to be run by a fundamentalist christian in order for all of the other nations to fall in line just before we move on i've noticed that obviously we're being featured at the moment if you happen to be watching from the outside do come join us you'll be joining the magic summit show with uh both mr and mrs uh, r and ra uh, concordance and stuff but we discuss 
issues of science and religion. Uh, at the moment, we seem to be talking about a person that I, I'm convinced is dead. I'm sure Pat Robertson has been dead for many years, and he's put in <laughs> ice when he's not on television. They I was wondering, and you know, worked yeah. like a uh, thunder, not a thunderfoot. God. I get the Thunderbird. Um, yeah, character. I wanted to know for a long time if he was an actual real person because he struck me as being so. And I mean, and mind you, this is going back to when I was a teenager when I first came across him. Pat Robertson struck me then as being so bewilderingly stupid that it was not possible that he was actually the leader of the Christian coalition or whatever it was that he's supposed to be in charge of this this seven hundred club or anything. He had to be a puppet that was put there by people who were still capable of thinking, and they were using him for people to put the crosshairs on when they wanted to have somebody executed because he would be dispensable. He's like when, weekend at Bernie's, right? The little dead guy where they lift his arm with the string and... <laughs> yes, that's what Pat Robertson is. <laughs> when, when he found out that... Um, that he was wrong. He admitted he was wrong, and he he said that sometimes he gets the voice of God wrong, and that is the yeah. stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, like sometimes I get the voice of right? sometimes my what, sometimes I get the voice of God wrong as well, and it comes out like, "Hey, Pluto, dust to dust." <laughs> <laughs> That's me getting the voice of God wrong. <laughs> Well, this uh, this is an interesting. Thing. Let, let's 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 see where this takes us because that actually raises an issue, one of my favourite issues, about God's ability to communicate. If God was this all powerful, all wonderful, whatever, He's going to include in that all powerful stuff and all brilliant stuff the ability to communicate. Why is it that God is so crap at communicating that He ca He can't get His message across clearly? Even if He talks to you one on one, like He did with Pat Robertson, right? Uh, he still, he still can't. Maybe he stutters or something. I don't know. Okay, now, and I got to bring this up, and I know you guys have heard it before. Going to repeat it for some of the others that haven't. I took a uh, a Russian language class for a year or so, and for, for a very brief period, there was this elderly couple from deep south rural Texas, and they were in our class trying to learn Russian because they were called by God to be missionaries. So they're going to learn Russian and go make Christians out of them communists. As you might imagine, they were not able to complete the course. Uh, for some reason, these people were incapable of pronouncing words in Russian, no matter how hard we tried to teach them. God <laughs> called them to do this. This was God's idea, and God is infallible and all-wise, but they had to drop out of the class within six weeks because of their own ineptitude. And I want to know how they reconcile that in their minds, that God couldn't come up with a better decision than that. Well, Or that he couldn't make them learn the language. I think that Dark Matter yeah. 2525's <laughs> um, video on this, uh, God's PR department, uh, is absolutely wonderful. I mean, if, if there really is a God, do you think that he would choose the likes of Nephilim Free, Jesus Freak, Venom Fang X to be his messengers? Of course. He's got a sense of humor, you know. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not enough that you have a preposterous belief that is not supported by evidence. You really have to go that extra step further and make sure that you have plenty of evidence to the contrary. That's what Jesus' excuse was for, for um, choosing him and his, and his fishermen disciples, that it must be the voice of God, because how else would fishermen and a Galilean be able to, to um, say these things and stuff like that? But this is God, right? So this is Jesus. Jesus is God. So Jesus comes to the fig tree, and he doesn't know when figs are in season, and there's no figs on the tree, so he gets mad, so he curses the tree. This is God. Okay. I don't want to get on another tirade. Actually, no, you're right. And um, he curses the fig tree and nothing happens. And then they go off and do something else more interesting for the day. And when they come back, all the disciples notice that the fig tree is dead. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe maybe, in the meantime, the carpenter just came along and chopped it down or something, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe this is a suitable time to move on to Concordance's next point that he wanted to raise. Uh, just before we do, again, it apparently seems that we're being featured, so do come and join us. 
Um, and also, Actually, if you'd like to join the most... show, send a Skype contact request to Magic Sandwich Show, and we will see if we can get you on. You do not have to raise any of the topics that we've talked about so far. You can raise your yeah, you uh, own raise topic, but uh, Concordance, I know, wanted to raise another matter. <laughs> First Thunder. First Thunder is yeah, I mean, very brief. Um, but Trinity in the Matrix could learn how to helicopter in seconds, and presumably she would have learned a language in seconds, but God can't teach his followers in seconds. So. And, you know, and, and uh, well, you know, God needs uh, money to do these things, apparently. Lots but of money. That's just, you that's know, I can't believe we didn't problem. lead off with the most important story of all, guys. And that is that the world is ending in less than three weeks. You all we have discuss, less than three weeks to live. We discussed this over over lunch. Um, yeah, um, and it, it's bizarre. The 2012 end of the Mayan calendar thing only seemed to have any purchase like two or three years ago, when it was sufficiently distant, and now it's right around the corner. All of the internet hype about it seems to have dropped off the face of the map. I mean, they they got a feature movie out of it for Christ's sake. Something about the Earth's core absorbing neutrinos, which. Uh... <laughs> okay, well, well so I have to say, no, one second, Aaron, before we go. On, uh, so far as the calendar is concerned, I saw this recently, or I heard it, and I can't remember where I did or um, who it was that said it. So I apologise for plagiarising this joke, but uh, it goes along the lines of I went out and bought an advent calendar. The other day, and apparently the world doesn't end on the 12th or 21st or whatever. It actually ends on the 31st 21st. when the advent calendar runs out, and that's absolutely <laughs> undisputable proof. There's going to be a current. Let me quote. I, I, let me quote, I, I, guys. I, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a the 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 end all joke on this. He says it's hard to take seriously predictions about the end of the world from the Maya, a culture that could not predict their own demise. Exactly where I was going. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and and since uh, Thunder mentioned you know that they got a movie out of it for Christ's sake, I just wanted to mention that premiering this Tuesday night in Dallas, Texas, and in Las Vegas, Nevada, there is a film for Christ's sake. It's called The Zombie Christ, and I and my son are extras in this film. So this is a movie with something extra. Me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be interviewing the people that made the movie later on today. We're going to try to do a little promo video for it. And I just playing to throw a biker, that out. right? Yeah, I'm a biker, and, and my son is, I think, zombie number 26. But he's also in the credits as Blood Monkey, because his job was to splatter blood on the, on the, the other zombies to get them ready for shoots. I Great have to fun. say again, uh, self-promotion of the show. Look, we've not only got an international renowned public speaker, we've also got a film star. Come on. <laughs> what what other show offers you this sort of thing? How long how long are you are you actually uh, on screen for, Aaron? Oh, I don't know. There's I mean, there, I would be surprised if there's two or three scenes where you get to even recognize me. Um there's there, there's one I know they won't cut out. Why did they need makeup for you? Makeup. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 advert or the the invitation that I got was, do you want to be a zombie or just yourself? That was my point. <laughs> okay, my <laughs> tough call, <laughs> tough call. Yeah, yeah. And I don't remember what I was going to say now, so I'm going to leave it. Um, concordance. I'm sorry. I thought there was something. Uh, help me out. Here. Yeah, third one, if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought you were going to quote Tyson in relation to another matter. No, no. He's got he's got some really funny stuff to say though. He's he's got. Um, you might have failed Astro One Hundred and One on Twitter, uh, where he talks about people and and their cluelessness about things like planetary alignments and the solar max and a series of stuff. But he's hilarious, man. He's he's having a good time with all these people that are predicting the end of the world. But they're, they're getting nowhere near as much interest as they used to. In fact, I'm just going to do a search for it. Um, so what do you reckon? Mayan Cullen. I'm going to see how its, uh, its web traffic comes out on the Google Trends, okay? And there's still some discussion of this in the chat room, so I'm just going to mention that Jesus comes back to Earth in the future, in the post-apocalyptic future that was envisioned 
in the 1980s. So go back to the 80s and then re, you know then rewind and go back up to Mad Max angle. But it's Jesus comes back and he's got rotting flesh and green skin and all of this, and Jesus is leading an army of zombies. And there's an army of bikers being led by one of his apostles to try to to try to beat them down. So Jesus is also the villain, the bad guy in this. And as I understand it from the shorts that I've seen, it may be a comedy, uh, but it may also be the worst zombie picture I've ever seen. And I think that's saying something. And just so you know, um, I'm actually sort of partially surprised at this. It does look like there is going to be a spike in interest whether the world is really going to end it's going up and up and up is the interest in 2012 which i can only think yeah this is its last gasp everyone's What's, just waiting how does are you able to tell i don't know what you're looking at are you able to tell how it compares with previous end of earth um predictions i'm thinking in particular of harold camping oh, um yeah that let's try big -eared that's a good one. one who came out with a couple two well, I mean, didn't one, we yeah. have didn't we have three endings of the world just in the last two years? Oh, there's probably more than that. Harold Camping came out with two. Of oh, his own he goes by himself, uh, Harold okay. Camping Dwarfs 2012. He absolutely dwarfs it. Um, so 2012 comes in with an av um, the big in 2012 interest go up to about 11. They're, they're, they, uh, there's only about 10% is the big spikes in 2012 compared to Harold Camping's End of the World. That's 100. So um, it's, it's about 10 to 1. But if, if anyone is seriously interested in this, I would recommend that they Google uh, the Doomsday Book, um, which lists all of the End of World predictions, um, of which there are literally hundreds in this century alone, and prior to that, thousands. And you know, DPR, I, I was going to say one other thing about Tyson. I'm sorry. Uh, and that was, uh, he's recently made a statement about the purposefulness of the universe. I had completely forgotten about that. I was trying to prompt um, you. Yes. Sorry. Uh, and all of this, I think, could be couched in the discussion of the Templeton Foundation. Now, the Templeton Foundation pays famous scientists, particularly scientists and philosophers and theologians, to make profound pro-theist uh, statements. So they are a foundation that promotes religious thought among scientists, and they, they have these grants that they will give to scientists if they will simply agree to say that, yes, God exists, all this evidence of nature points to the existence of a god. And so there's a certain... <laughs> There's a certain um, abhorrence of people who are willing to sell out, basically, uh, in order to get that tantalizing money. And I think that uh, Tyson has sort of flirted with it quite a bit, and he's showing up more and more often on these lists. But at the same time, he then turns around and says things like, you know, there doesn't appear to be any purpose to the universe, and anyone that studies the universe can understand that, that it apparently has absolutely no purpose. So he's not comfortable with atheism because that locks off all the funding opportunities for the promotion of science that he could use that money for. But at the same time, he's not, he's not ready to be bedfellows with the Templeton Foundation. Well, before we take our first caller, I, I, I want to see if we can um, progress that uh, topic a little bit. Uh, I, I struggle to even understand the question, does the universe have a purpose? Um, it seems to me to make no sense. Oh, and, and what sort of answer are they expecting? And is it not incredibly arrogant of us to assume that there even is such a thing as a purpose? Can we just talk about that for a second? Apparently, well, I, like to look at it. I like to look at the cosmic scale, you know, and when you when you start looking at the recent evidence that's that's or the the, the way they describe how they detect dark matter, for example, when they talk about the, the, the fabric of the entire universe, when you start looking at not just our planet in our, in our solar system or our solar system in our galaxy or in our galaxy in this phenomenal web network of other galaxies, we are so far beyond central or important or, or whatever. We, we are beneath consideration on any level. When you try to look at the entire cosmos, so you want you want to imagine that what is essentially a genie that really gives a damn whether you mix nylon and polyester, 
I mean, th this is the thing that created this huge network of galaxy clusters, and it and it it cares about whether you pick up sticks on Sunday. It's such a provincial thing. How could it possibly? It can't be global. How could it possibly be? uber galactic there's just no way it, it the the idea of a god defined as a god by you know, what a what a deity actually is is the simplest most simplistic most childish concept humans have ever come up with to explain anything so i don't understand how you, you know you pay scientists to say this you know what come come pay me i could use money and I'll just say this stupid thing. I'll be just as much of a sellout as when Ronnie James Dio started singing "This Bud's for You," but it's not going to change anything. People have to realize this is that this isn't by opinion. It's not by a vote. It's just not a possibility. Well, people won't be aware, but concordance is posted into the Skype chat that we're involved with. It's like Prime said, it's out of all proportion to the universe. I agree with that, but I don't think that that necessarily. Is the answer they're looking for? Is it? I don't, I, I just don't know. I, I I don't. I can't really understand the question sufficiently. I, I can. can. I mean, I can. I can. I, I could even quote. I, I won't. I won't read the long sections. But people like Jane Goodall, religious scientist. Jane Goodall studied the chimps, and in her work, she senses that the idea of material, a purely material universe, doesn't adequately account for the appearance of things which we find so wonderful. You know, the creation of cathedrals, box music, um, the inspiration for beauty and love and justice and all these these ephemeral concepts is very hard to see where they come from. And I have my own theory on this and it has to do with emergent properties. Is yes. You cannot see the behavior of the colony in the actions of the ant. And you cannot see in the, the dab of paint the beauty of the painting. And so those of us who are by nature reductionist in our profession, in our approach to the world, who break the world down into these little chunks so that we can study the detail, every once in a while we pull back and look at the big picture and say, holy heck, I've been working on this amazing thing, at this amazing parts that all come together to produce something that was not there in the smallest component that I was studying. And so I think many scientists either find a spiritual aspect, respect for the thing that they're studying, or they end up as religious scientists being paid by the Templeton Foundation to say found things about God. And may, those I are may, really the two paths. Either you find your sort of inspiration. I may have not expressed myself particularly well. I think there are, this is the issue. There is a difference between the question, what is the purpose of humanity or mankind being on in, in this universe, and what is the purpose of the universe as a whole? And when I'm, I specifically was referring to what is the purpose of the universe, no, I mean, at that point, yeah, I, I think don't see that the question saying, has any, any sense. No, the, the, the fundamental problem is both of those things are begging the question. You know, what is the purpose of mankind assumes that there is a purpose to mankind. What is the purpose of the universe assumes that there is a purpose to the universe. Yeah, until you've actually established that there is one, what's the point of speculating what it is? I would go further than saying that the universe doesn't have a purpose. I would go to say that the universe is quite brutal. It, look at Mars. Mars is not large enough to hold an atmosphere. Therefore, whatever life that might have started there never had a chance. It, 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 it either happens for you in the right way or it doesn't. There's no but, purpose. But Mrs. Ra, I want to go back at you. Um, why, why could it not be that the purpose of the universe is to be harsh, cruel, and brutal? Because the whole anthropic principle is that the universe was designed with humanity in mind, well, right? Who, who, who necessarily adopts the anthrop anthropic principle? Most I mean, of it, it, this, is, this is how <laughs> stupid the question gets. Why shouldn't it be that the universe is deliberately out there to kill off any kind of life? <laughs> that is created. Why not? I mean, this is my It's story. hostile. The universe is actually hostile. But that goes against the fine-tuning argument. It's, for the most part, really hostile. You muted yourself. You can unmute. DPR, unmute your mic. Let, let me play devil's advocate while DPR figures out his mute button. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's say that all of that space... 
I have ever made in two and a half years on this program, and I had my mic muted. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's say amateurs. that uh, all of that empty space, all of those hostile environments, are there to make place places for different kinds of life. What what if they're all basically part of the requirement for life? What if we have to have all these vast distances so that two species won't evolve on the same adjacent planets or in the same uh, solar system? What if there are scattered throughout the universe uh, galaxies and stars and planets that, that harbor life but if they're too close together, we get something undesirable. What what if the universe is fine-tuned? And, of course, we can't understand it, but what, what if it truly is the only possible configuration of planets and worlds because that could God possibly produce has, us? God has unlimited ability, and if God can create anything that is infinite in time, he can create it as infinite in space. This planet that we live on did not have to be a planet. It didn't have to be one out of godzillions of other ones that are bigger and better. This planet could have been a single straight plane, a map. It's infinite in every direction. It could have been a flat plane continuing forever. If, if God wanted to do it that way, God could have done that way. And if God was, had, you know, had these unlimited abilities and made us some special creations, then why wouldn't it be just like when we make special creations, like the, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man that's created by that God in that movie. And, and one of the things that you see about these fictional characters is they don't poop. They don't have to eat. They don't have to live on these uh, on these chemical cycles and all like that. See, God has unlimited ability, so he could make people that are Stay Puft Marshmallow Men, and they don't have to poop. They don't have to come up with that, all this vulgarity. We don't have to be animals. There's so much more that a God with infinite power could have done and would have done and evidently didn't do only because he doesn't exist. Well, maybe the answer to the question is he made the universe in this way just to sort of like confuse us and trick us and to make uh, Lawrence Krauss famous. No, 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 no. There's a, there's a far simpler explanation, and that that uh, the universe is designed like a computer game, in that if it was easy, if it was easy to live in, then the game would be over very quickly. Whereas if you make the game almost impossibly hard then it keeps you interested for longer. Yes, but I mean, in any game... And, and in any game, you need, lots of, you need lots of people to get killed, and you need a respawn button, which is But then you also, have, you also achieve a higher level, and we don't see that happening. Uh, ro robots on bars? <laughs> no, I mean, what, what, what should happen if this was a video game, then reincarnation would be the way. You wouldn't have eternal judgments, you'd have reincarnation, but you'd be reincarnating with, with improved lifespan, with improved abilities, improved levels, so that you're coming back in different planets, different worlds. It should be like Heavy Metal Magazine back in the 1980s. You know, anybody remember that from the 70s and 80s? You had all these great stories that are going on in different worlds with different kinds of life forms, and, and you could be reincarnated this way. In, uh, all oh, these come on! Realities. It's a game like it's a game like Civilization. You don't play the individuals; you play the civilization. And on some occasions, God seems to be like he's playing both sides of the chessboard. He moves the piece and gets up and moves the pieces on the white side too. Well, That's why he has the heart, the heart of Pharaoh. Maybe he's an only child. Apparently, yes. <laughs> As an only child, he has to play both sides of the game. Then the purpose would be you would have a capricious god with an ant farm. With an ant farm? <laughs> yes, yes, I think Bill Holmes. The thing is, the thing is uh, Mrs. Orr, I, I totally agree with that. But the, if, if you um, are able to give up the idea that God is indeed all loving, and there's good reason to give up that idea because all the evidence from the Bible suggests that he is not all loving, he's a really hateful person, then why not? Why could that not be the purpose of the universe, for God to play out some experiment because he was getting bored with the solitude that he'd had for eternity? I imagine an eternity of solitude would make you pretty bitter. <laughs> A few years yeah, of I'm solitary bored. confinement seems to send most people mad. Um, again, uh, can I just remind people if you'd like to join the show, send a Skype contract request through... Maybe that's why uh, he talks Magic to me. So so One second, so please. Uh, if, I may, if I may just finish. Please, 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 I don't know how many times I have to say this, do not send one without the gist of the topic or question that you want to raise, otherwise you will be ignored or booted out. Anyway, we have waited patiently, uh, or David has wait, waited patiently 
uh, for Actually, us. Let, let me waiting. DPR. So, sorry? Let me briefly add a point. Well, very briefly, on, and then we're going to take the call. Right? Thunder, and then yeah. the caller. On, on um, cute ways of summarizing the universe. The true beauty of a self-inquiring sentient universe is lost on those who elect, uh, who elect to walk the intellectually vacuous path of comfortable paranoid fantasies. Don't know where I heard it, but it's good. On that note, on that bombshell, let us move on to our first caller. Welcome to the show, David, and thank you for your patience. Hello, can you hear me? Perfectly, yes. One, one thing, my sister's calling me. I know you have a couple of points that you'd like to raise. Um, let's take them one at a time. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, actually, I was just going to advance what you were saying earlier about the purpose of the universe. Um, I'd like to ask the question: uh, What would be the purpose of heaven? Um, I mean, it seems. I mean, even if you grant that there is a purpose to the universe and that purpose is to get to heaven, what is then the purpose of heaven? Um, you know, is it to sing songs and praise God for all eternity? That seems like a really quite a dumb, boring eternity to me. Well, I, I ignore what it would be like for the poor little sentient beings if you're an infinitely powerful being, having someone do the same thing day after day would get boring pretty quick, I would imagine. Well, yeah. So, I mean, even if you grant them that there is a purpose to something, it, 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 it's incredibly pointless because the I've got it. Like... God, God. God believes that he, um, he's been a bad boy, which he has, and so he's going to torture himself for eternity by having people worship him for eternity. Yeah, imagine some of the like, oh, it'll be awful. Um, but what I what I wanted to call in about was um, this. Uh, Sorry, this before you move on, let me just throw in another bit about heaven. Um, heaven is supposed to be a place where the gold batch wearing good people go to spend eternity. But my understanding of some people's interpretation of heaven is that they can actually hear the screams from hell. Now, given the fact that it's more than likely that some of your relatives are going to be down there screaming, uh, how, are you supposed to be enjoying heaven whilst listening to their screams? I guess so. Very odd. That, anyway. uh, that, that shows how, how vindictive that position is and how infantile the perspective is. And once again, the idea of punishing people simply because of what they believe. When David Silverman was on uh, Bill O'Reilly's show last week, I noticed Bill O'Reilly did something interesting. He, he expressed what a reasonable person he is because he's completely accepting and tolerant of the fact that, that David Silverman does not believe in the same God that Bill O'Reilly does. So Bill O'Reilly has elevated himself apparently above his own God because God does give a damn what you believe and he doesn't give a damn about anything else. The idea of kneeling so Bill, Bill O'Reilly fills me with horror, and kissing his <laughs> ring doesn't fill me with uh, uh, no. Anyway, let's move on to David's second point. Um, yeah, I mean, it was mostly about the the tactic that um, the religious seems to be using. Uh, I know I've got a, it's not a quote, but it's, it seems to be like let the kids decide for themselves. So show them both sides of the argument, and then let them decide. I mean, it almost seems to me like. Um, because science, science has already discovered these things, like we know certain things like the fact that populations evolve over time. And it seems to me like the, they don't like this result, so they're saying, oh no, can we just do it again? And then we'll show the results not to a, a bunch of educated scientists who actually know something about this topic, but we'll show it instead to 12-year-olds, uh, and then they can decide. Uh, you know, these people aren't qualified to make this decision, they're not qualified to... Uh, to assess whether or not evolution is, I mean, in most cases, teachers aren't qualified to, to make that assessment. So how can the, the children themselves be educated to make that assessment? I mean, it's quite an obvious tactic. They're clearly trying to imprint on these children the here idea. In Texas, that, say, here in Texas, the Republican Party platform uh, would have permitted teachers to challenge the scientific consensus and unteach their science classrooms. The Republican Party platform would also have allowed students to disrupt education on specifically the, the, the cases of, of science that touch on uh, origins of life, uh, biodiversity, or climate change. The students would be allowed to contest the teachers, according to the platform, to disrupt the classroom and prevent studies from occurring. 
and they had if you read the platform out and i've got uh, snippets from it on my blog you'll see the the portions that have highlighted that would allow this to happen they don't want to be taught they don't want they don't care what the facts are they really don't care truth is completely irrelevant they want to indoctrinate children and they want to get their minds paralyzed before the children actually have a chance to understand anything because once they do understand then then it's like you said when you actually get to see a comparison of the facts then you can make a decision but you have to have that information first you can you can push religion on people that don't have any background information and it's better if you choose people that don't have any background information than people who actually understand and know know anything I've seen what it's like when you uh, teach the other side. There isn't very much to teach. I, I, uh, I'm taking a break from science teaching, but my son was in an after-school Bible camp. And, I mean, what are you going to say? When you teach biology, you can teach about dinosaurs. But this, this guy was like, was like uh, all right, children, everybody um, say, uh, God said let there be a dinosaur. And there was a dinosaur. I mean, what, what kind of, how is that? It isn't very... Um, it isn't very interesting. It, it it it's very short. It's like it's cheating, and I don't. I wouldn't know what what how to teach both sides. Where would I go? Oh, here here's a here's a tiger, and he's amazing, right? God must have created him. Is that how you would teach that? And here's a parasite, mm -hmm. and wow, that's interesting from a purely scientific perspective. God didn't make that, right? It's yeah, because of the at, fall, children. <laughs> look at how it's designed to burrow into your eye and eat your brain. I think Gunther <laughs> did a video on. I know who was it that did a video on that. Oh, it was a really good video, and um, it uh, it was um, in response to the um, intelligent design. My uh, Doctor Behe. I know doctor. that Potholer Fifty Four did one. Yeah, that's it. But they, that was about smallpox and the uh, bacteria yeah. flagella. He said he was like, yes, I'm I'm conf I've converted yeah. now. Look, look at this. How could this not be designed? The way that the flagellum makes this thing burrow through the lining of your stomach. <laughs> 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 the way he did it was brilliant. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think it's a there's a there's a wonderful line that um, Hannibal Lecter comes up with in Silence of the Lambs when he's talking on I think the first or maybe second uh, encounter he has with Clarice Starling, um, and he refers to swans and syphilis. And how you can't pick and choose either you accept that God made it made everything or or nothing and i I, I always use that one swans or syphilis which which one or you could teach the children it's because of you children you're sinners that's why we have syphilis yeah, because you sinned fun. you have a sin nature daddy drinks because you cry <laughs> <laughs> well it's worse than that um it's not that you sinned it's one of your most the most distant um relative actually sinned. And, and what I have to say is seems to be a somewhat uh, harmless way by eating some fruit. As a result of that, we end up with syphilis and tectonic plate movements. This is something actually that we touched upon last week. Didn't really get a satisfactory answer, if I remember concordance. You know, I know that there are people who really earnestly believe that because I've seen people believe some really amazingly, bewilderingly stupid things. But there are a whole lot of people out there that I don't think they can believe what they believe in the same way that I believe what I believe. I mean, I have an actual confidence that I will be able to vindicate my point and therefore I'm not worried about any challenge to do so. And a lot of other people very much worry about having their beliefs challenged because it's apparent they know that those beliefs won't really be vindicated if you looked at them too too deeply. I believe that the whole thing is a matter of pretend, and that's why truth is irrelevant. 